Brethren, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given you in Jesus Christ, that in all things you are made rich in him. Words taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The inerrant Holy Bible is very, very clear. The gods that the pagans worship, the idols that the heathens bow down before, are demons, literally demons. King David, for example, wrote the following in the book of Psalms. He said, for all the gods of the Gentiles are devils, but the Lord, he made the heavens, unquote. The apostle to the Gentiles, St. Paul, confirmed this fact in one of his letters when he stated, quote, but the things which the heathens sacrifice to, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should be made partakers with devils, unquote. And because demons literally hid behind the images of the pagan gods and the heathen idols, the false religions of the ancient world could not lead men to virtue, obviously, but only to vice. Zeus, the king of the gods in Greek mythology, for example, was famously wicked. He lied, he cheated, especially when it came to tricking women into infidelity. And let's face it, lust, deceit, and bloodshed reign supreme in all of the pagan mythologies. And in light of this fact, today's neo-pagan, the new pagan of the modern world, must ask himself the following question. If imitation of the gods is what leads to a virtuous character, is virtue attainable at all in paganism? The false gods never made lasting or true covenants with human beings. Filled with lies and deceit, goodwill contracts meant nothing to the gods of the heathens. In fact, the false gods purposely broke agreements and went back on promises they made with men. The promises they made were worthless, and men didn't feel bound by any agreements that they made with the gods. In fact, they would often try to trick the gods with their own deceitful behavior in order to gain an advantage. On the other hand, the one true God, the triune God of one God and three divine persons, the God of Israel and the God of the new Israel, was and is different, very different. He was and is the God of covenants, the God who makes promises and infallibly keeps them. The good Lord always delivers. He delivers his end of the bargain, for he has bound himself. Therefore, he and his mother and all the saints are trustworthy. As St. Paul wrote in the letter to the Hebrews, he stated, quote, For God making promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater by whom he might swear, swore by himself saying, unless blessing I shall bless thee, and multiplying I shall multiply thee, unquote. God makes promises with men, and he delivers. In the book of Joshua, we read the following, quote, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass, unquote. All that God promises comes to be. And, of course, the great Benedictus, which was recited by Zechariah, the father of St. John the Baptist, emphasizes the keeping of the covenant by the good Lord. Zechariah says, Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, that he would grant to us, that being delivered from the hand of our enemies, we may serve him without fear, unquote. In short, then, God promised deliverance. He promised a savior. He promised redemption and salvation, and he delivered. Having bound himself in an agreement with mere human creatures like us. And so with this in mind, we ought to attend to the promises 
made by the good Lord and his holy mother and the holy saints even today. If God keeps his promises, then we can trust that he'll do something for us. Consider, for example, the promises of the Sacred Heart as made to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. For those who are devoted to what is known as the Nine First Fridays, devotions and reparations to the Sacred Heart, for those devoted to that, we have the promises of God. God will provide us many things, including graces necessary for our state in life, graces necessary for peace in our families and our homes, graces of conversion and further conversion, and of course that wondrous, infallible promise made by Christ when he stated, quote, I promise you, God is speaking to a woman, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. I promise you, and all that follow the Sacred Heart devotion, I promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays in nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They'll keep the faith until the end. Continuing on, our Lord promised, they shall not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving their last sacraments. And then he ends by saying, my divine heart shall be their safe refuge at their last moment, unquote. We should attend to these promises made by the good Lord. In addition, one should also attend to the promises connected with the brown scapular. I can't imagine anyone not wearing the brown scapular, seriously. What about the promises made regarding the first five Saturdays? Five first Saturdays of five consecutive months. And if we do this, we can be safe from the fires of hell. We can have our time in purgatory shortened and have the assurance that Mary will be there for us on our deathbed. That's promised all by the brown scapular and the first five Saturdays. But this is the month of October, the month of the Holy Rosary. And I think it's helpful that we review the 15 promises made by Our Lady to St. Dominic and to Blessed Alain de la Roche regarding the Most Holy Rosary. When she gave the rosary to St. Dominic, she said, I promise you this if you pray this prayer. If we consider the infallible, they're unfailing promises. They can't be broken by the good Lord or his mother. If we consider the unfallible promises made, then maybe, maybe we will not fail to pray this most powerful prayer. If we listen to these pledges, their word of honor given by the very mother of God, then we'll be more motivated to pick up the rosary, to carry it on our person, to finger its beads, and to hold it now in our living hands, and not just in our coffin at death. And to pray it knowing that we are assured of wondrous things from Mary, but she's given her word on the matter. Let us pray this most highly indulgent prayer of Mary, for she said, And she promised this. Whatever you ask in the rosary will be granted. Financial burdens. A child away from the holy faith. A spouse who is habitually unfaithful. For the conversion of one's family or one's nation. For success in war against the infidel. For our president so persecuted by political and media elites, as well as the radical left. Praise the rosary. And what you ask will be answered. Again, the 15 promises made by our Blessed Mother to St. Dominic regarding the Holy Rosary. Number one, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. Signal graces. In other words, there will be certain graces given to you so extraordinary that others will even notice. You'll be a sign to others. Signal graces are signs sent by God to help us make the right decisions in life. What should we do? Where should we move? What job should I take? Signal graces 
help keep us moving infallibly in the right direction. Number two, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all those who shall recite the rosary. That is, Mary has bound herself to protect in a special and powerful way that individual who prays the rosary. Number three, the rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice, decrease sin, and defeat heresies. That's the promise made. Because hell has no power over the rosary. Habitual, chronic sin cannot coexist for any length of time in one that prays the rosary. Heresies within the membership of the church are defeated by all that pray this powerful prayer. Number four, the rosary will cause virtue and good works to flourish. It will obtain for souls the abundant mercy of God. It will withdraw hearts of men from the love of the world and its vanities and will lift them to the desire of eternal things. Promise of our Blessed Mother. Number five, the soul which recommends itself to me by the recitation of the rosary shall not perish. Promise of the Blessed Mother. Pause here. Pause and note this promise. Who would not pray the rosary knowing that it literally prevents us from perishing in the fires of hell below? Number six, whoever shall recite the rosary devotedly, applying himself to the consideration of its sacred mysteries, shall never be conquered by misfortune. God will not chastise him in his justice. He will not perish in an unprovided death. If he be just, he shall remain in the grace of God and become worthy of eternal life. You shall not be perishing in an unprovided for death. That's a great promise. How many people die without the sacraments each day? How many die without a final confession each day? How many die without extreme unction each day? Pray the rosary. You'll get those things. And that's number seven included that in, in this promise. Whoever shall have devotion to the rosary shall not die without the sacraments. People who want to die in their sleep are foolish. Absolutely foolish. You should want to be aware of what's going on and you want to make that final confession. Number eight, those who are faithful to recite the rosary shall have during their life and at their death the light of God and the plenitude of his graces and shall participate in the merits of the saints in paradise. Number nine, I shall live from purgatory, she promises, those who have been devoted to the rosary. Even in the afterlife, Mary will take care of her disciples who fingered their beads by lifting them up from the church suffering and bring them to the church triumphant. Number 10, the faithful children of the rosary shall merit a high degree in the glory of heaven, giving God more glory, more charity, more love, a higher place in heaven. Number 11, you shall obtain all you ask by the recitation of the Holy Rosary. All you ask. Only an all-powerful intercessor could promise such a thing. And Mary is omnipotent in her prayers to the Most High, who cannot but answer her requests for us. Number 12, all those who propagate, spread the Holy Rosary, shall be aided by me in their necessities. Such a promise that you'll be rewarded by getting others to pray the rosary drove blessed Bartolo Longo to spread devotion to the Holy Rosary as a way of his making reparation for his sins of embracing the occult and Satanism. He was a Satanist. Started praying the rosary, promulgating the rosary, and became a blessed, a beati. Number 13, I have obtained from my divine son that all the advocates of the rosary shall have for intercessors the entire celestial court during their life and at the hour of their death. Are we even reading this? Do we even refer to this? She promises that if you pray the rosary, the entire heavenly court 
will be there for you in your needs on earth and will be there for you at your greatest time of temptation, which is when you're dying. When the devil has one last chance to get your soul. And she says, you pray the rosary, every saint and angel in heaven will be there for you. Number 14, all who recite the rosary are my sons and daughters and brothers and sisters of my only son, Jesus Christ. What does that suggest then? Think about it. All who recite the rosary are my sons and daughters. What about those who don't recite the rosary? Actually haven't recited it in years. Are they Mary's sons and daughters? I'm just reading what she promises. And number 15, finally. Devotion to my rosary is a great sign of predestination. That is, those who pray the rosary are most likely, almost assuredly, one of the elect who will go to heaven. Those who don't pray the rosary, make your own conclusion. The good Lord and his mother make promises all the time for us. And they keep those promises. We would be foolish not to take advantage of all the opportunities they provide us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.